Sean Patton, if we can give him a warm welcome. All right, and actually a fun fact about that first question, homeowners bring in 66% of all new invasive species. So they're actually more than governments and businesses combined. In fact, water hyacinth, one of the worst invasive species in all of recorded history and is invasive on almost every single continent except where it's native from, was brought to Florida by a homeowner in the 1860s where she bragged about it in a local paper. So we know the exact time, date, and place. And she would be paying billions for the damage that she's caused. So, <laughs> on to a happier note. And that is a long title. So I am going to cover multimodal biological control of Florida ponds and wetlands. Now, before everyone gets scared and walks away, it's really simple. What is multimodal biological control? It's basically using complementary or species that work well together to target a certain nuisance species. For instance, if you want to remove algae from a pond, right now when we dig ponds, we dig an empty hole in the ground, we fill it with water, and we put an outfall structure so nothing can come in, things can only leave, water can only leave. And the only fish you're required to put in is mosquito fish. So by stocking things that can help target multiple issues, you can fix your pond algae issue a lot faster. And so what are some of the goals of this? Well, we're trying to reduce chemical usage. This is a big one, especially with the glyphosate, uh, which is the Roundup lawsuit going on right now. We're trying to reduce treatment costs because personally, as a broke millennial, I don't want to pay for storm water. I don't think anyone here does. There's far better things like alcohol, going out to the movies, hanging out with your friends. There's a lot better things you could spend your money on. Then reduce the time needed to treat ponds. As someone who treats a lot of ponds, it takes forever, especially if you're going out there and spraying each individual invasive. Imagine if you were to put a chemical into the pond that would seek out the thing you want to get rid of, would last forever and actually reproduce and become better over time. There's no chemical like that that exists, but a fish does. And if you classify a fish like a chemical, it's great. It lasts forever, and believe me, fish don't give you cancer. Improve water quality. That's one of the big goals. We're dealing with red tide. We're dealing with poor water quality, which affects home value. We're dealing with just nasty stuff growing in all our water. So many different harmful algae blooms. By improving water quality, we can tackle a lot of those. In fact, the Sarasota Water Quality Summit said that even if red tide had nothing, absolutely nothing to do with water quality, we should still improve water quality for the hundreds of other benefits we get. Improve biodiversity. If you count sport fishing and kayaking, which for whatever reason it's not, as environmental tourism, the environmental tourism in Florida doubles our cultural and sports tourism, if you count those two in with it. And it is one of the biggest drivers of why people come to Florida and where we all get our jobs and money. And I don't know about you all, but I like having a house. Improve sports fishing. Everyone likes fishing or, you know, drinking and not fishing, you know, it's, they kind of go hand in hand. And sports fishing is one of the largest industries in Florida. It is a multi-billion dollar industry, especially if you include fresh and salt water. It is by far one of the largest industries in Florida and there are thousands of different species that you can fish for. And if we can improve that in any way, it's going to impact a lot of people. Reduce eutrophication through nutrient lockup. Eutrophication basically means there's too many nutrients in a pond. When you go up north, it's not as much of an issue because if like you have a New York pond, sometimes people will intentionally throw nutrients in there to get plants to grow faster so that you can see them for the two months of summer before it's winter forever. Florida is almost in an eternal summer. Even during our worst growing season, plants are still growing to some extent. And with a year-round growing season, you don't want things to grow faster. You want to have the growth that you want. And when you have year-round algae growth, I've seen ponds covered in thousands of tons of algae in the middle of winter. So this is a big issue, and we want to reduce nutrients. If nutrients are going into fish and invertebrates and beautiful plants, we don't have to worry about it going into algae. And then last but not least is sedimentation. That's basically where sand, clay, and gunk builds up on the bottom of the pond, and you have to dredge it out, and it's disgusting, smelly work, or it washes out of your pond into the bays, and then it smothers all those lovely seagrasses and oysters, and all the saltwater projects get mad at the freshwater people, and I'm like, hey, I got a quarter of the budget you do. What do you want? All right, and here are some of the big environmental hazards that we have. Raise your hand if you like red tide. <laughs> Raise your hand if you like mosquitoes. No, put your hand down, sir. 
And then also we have climate change and sea level rise. And a uh, big thing they don't mention about climate change is that um, as Florida used to have big deep freezes and that would kill off a lot of the invasive tropical species because our native species were used to that cold. But in the past about 20 years, those deep freezes are getting shorter and shorter and sometimes we aren't even having them. And now we're seeing all these invasive species move farther north like Nile crocodiles, pythons, hundreds of invasive fish species, and the worst one is a giant Brazilian mosquito about this big. It doesn't carry any diseases, which is good, but it can bite through genes. Yeah, you're not even safe in genes anymore. And then invasive plants, which actually are far more damaging to our economies than the invasive animals. In fact, they estimated to remove one invasive plant, hydrilla, which is right there, from 70 of Florida's largest lakes and water bodies, it would be between two and five billion dollars with herbicides. That's one plant in 70 lakes. Do you know what we could do with two to five billion dollars? We could pay for kindergarten for all Americans for a few years. We could, you know, have a war in any country we wanted for a few years. We could restore countless acres of habitat. There are so many different things we could do with two to five billion dollars, but instead we're spending that on invasive plants that for the most part were brought here because we thought they looked good in our yards or our fish tanks. That's stupid. And so here is just a quick overview of all the different places nutrients can come from. Um, a lot of people point to agriculture and you know sugar farming for Lake Okeechobee, but it's not just that. Urban runoff, the dust that just lands on buildings, um, fertilizer put into garden spaces, uh, residential runoff, septic tanks are a big one for the flesh-eating bacteria. And then all that goes into the water. And if there's too much for the native species to take in, it becomes eutrophied. And that's where you get the big algae blooms. And as we overfish and we remove the things that can eat algae, and we're pumping more and more nutrients into these systems, you're starting to notice more and more algae blooms. And climate change has another fun side effect. Higher heat and higher CO2 cause most plants to grow more, and algae are the fastest growing plants on the planet. When you look at the food pyramid on land, you notice that top predators are the smallest part of the pyramid and plants are the biggest. But in the ocean, it's reversed. Whales are actually the most biomass. In terms of just weight, the big top predators and the big filter feeders weigh more than anything else in the ocean. And you're like, well, that doesn't make sense. What are they eating? That's because almost everything in the ocean eats at some point that algae. Because algae doubles in weight almost every six hours for some species. That's a lot of algae. So no wonder the whales can eat it. And the whales also live a pretty long time. Like when you've got some sharks and whales living over 400 years, they have you know, some time to get that big. Here's some cute fish. And here are some wonderful invasive plants. Primrose willows, which most of you don't know, but anyone who works in land management does. I see you crying back there. Wild taro, which was actually brought as a slave food crop and then became invasive because people weren't taking care of it. And that just goes to show another reason why colonialism sucks. Um, salvia, which is a small floating water fern. Um, this will just cover waterways. In fact, any floating plant that completely covers a water body can kill everything underneath it by causing all the plants on the bottom to not be able to photosynthesize. They die. Decay always removes oxygen from the water, and it causes a fish kill. And then I get paid 12 bucks an hour to go out there and pick up all those fish, and I hate it. Most people are familiar with air potato and Brazilian pepper. Air potato has the big potatoes, and some of you might even know that they release the little beetles to eat it. And Brazilian pepper is in the poison sumac family. So if you're allergic to poison sumac and ivy, don't touch that plant. You are probably allergic to it. And the best part is it's a tree that grows six feet a year, tops out at about 30 feet, and was brought here because we thought it looked nice in yards. We spend hundreds of millions fighting this tree in um, Florida alone. It's one of the biggest things we deal with. Please, if you take one thing away from this presentation, stop planting Brazilian peppers. If I had a dollar for every topiary Brazilian pepper I'd see, I would be a millionaire. Plant native plants. And so here are the biological controls that are commonly used in these projects. None of them are native to Florida, and um, each one has a specific use. So the alligator leaf and air potato beetles are very specific. They're called obligate herbivores, which means they only eat one plant and they will starve to death on just about anything else. Air potato beetles will only eat air potato. In fact, if you try to put them on something that looks just like air potato, the winged yam, which is only a different species, it's in the same genus. It's so closely related. The only difference is the potato looks a little different. It will starve to death. 
it only eats air potato, which is why it's a good control organism, because you can just release it into an area. You don't care how many of the beetles there are because they just eat the air potato, and it's super cool. Same thing with the leaf beetle. And the last one that we use commonly is the grass carp. That ugly fish I like. I like a lot of ugly fish. Right? They think they're cute. But that fish gets six feet long and eats a lot of different plants and then is picky about some other plants. So it'll eat a lot of invasive plants, but it might eat the plants that are good for the pond. And also you can only put a six foot long fish in so many water bodies. And we use a sterile variety because they are invasive in some parts of the US and they have actually killed people. Well, when a six foot long fish gets scared by a boat motor and jumps out of the water and hits someone, that's 60 pounds of screaming fish running at your face. Invasive species are bad and I only use a few in a pond and generally there's no motorized boats. Again, invasive species are weird. This is what I deal with, giant screaming fish. And this is your average retention pond. Isn't it lovely? Look at all that duckweed. This is actually a native plant, but the pond has high nutrient levels, so it just spread out. There was nothing in the pond to eat it. The pond was dug. There was no shoreline vegetation. It was just grass to the edge. So the grass would start growing out into the pond, and they'd have to either pull it out or spray it with herbicides. And since a lot of herbicides are also made out of nutrients, that can slowly add up to the problem over time. Or some uh, herbicides that have copper in them. Copper does not break down. It is an element. And if you ever have an HOA or land management company and they're using copper, if you were to pick one herbicide not to use, I would rather they put gallons of Roundup on your property than copper because copper will not break down. And it also kills anything without a backbone. And since 70% of everything that eats algae and fresh water is an invertebrate without a backbone, you just killed 70% of the things that control algae. And even at the label rate, a lot of copper herbicides can cause fish kills because they suck the oxygen out of the water. So how do we control all this algae? How do we control all those midge flies? Which by the way, the mosquito fish that eats mosquitoes, the only fish required to put in a pond, its mouth is turned upward, so it only eats things at the surface of the water. Midge fly larvae live at the bottom of the pond. If your mouth only goes up, can you eat down? This is not rocket science, people. This is fish science. Like, come on, I have $30,000 in student loans to tell you that. Like, it's really not that complicated. And then of course we have filamentous algae. That's not toxic, that's just algae. Like algae is the basis of the food chain in most aquatic ecosystems, but sometimes you get so much of it that it smothers everything out. In fact, I've seen fish trapped in so much filamentous algae they drowned in the water because they couldn't move. A lot of fish need to you know, move through the water. Some are ram ventilation filter feeders, gotta show off my knowledge there. <laughs> And so these are the three most commonly stocked fish. And only one of them is required in Florida. That's this, that's the mosquito fish. So if you go to a new HOA, chances are this is the only thing living in your pond. Sometimes there's not even plants. Is this an ecosystem? Does this look like the food chain or the food web you drew in second grade? A second grader could design a better pond than what we're currently doing now. And so then, okay, some people are like, I've been a fish guy for uh, 200 years. I've been stocking sunfish and bass forever and my bass are big and healthy, but I have all those aquatic weeds so I spray them out with herbicides. Sunfish and bass are a big part of Florida, yes, but here's the thing. Sunfish, 95% of their diet is meat. Very, very little of it is plants and it's not, it's definitely not algae. So sunfish eat the little fish, which eat mosquitoes, and then bass eat the sunfish. Does anything I say just eat plants? Does anything I say eat algae? This is not rocket science, people. And so that's where I come in. That's why you should start stalking Savvy. That's, that's my business name, I'm sorry. I gotta plug at some point. And so there are a bunch of different species. Cooter turtles are actually a big problem in some aquatic growing operations because 80 to 90% of their diet can be algae and aquatic plants. And so sometimes they'll go up and they'll bite holes in all your nice plants that you're trying to grow. And that's good, you actually want them to eat plants, but sometimes you don't put them in fresh ponds. Then you also have, please don't laugh, we're all adults here, the Lake Chub Sucker, scientific name, Succida. Scientists are weird, folks. And that guy can actually eat a lot of midge flies, it eats algae, and it just kinda cleans up the bottom of your pond. It'll even eat the detritus and muck growing on your pond, as long as it's not pure sand. So it's a really good cleaner fish. Like if you've got a fish tank, and you're getting a bunch of algae growing, you get a Placostomus, right? and it cleans up your 
fish tank. Some people have actually tried putting Plecostomus in ponds, and now they're a class one invasive fish. And I've seen Plecostomus ponds. They don't have algae, but do you know what they do have? Five foot holes in the side of the bank where people's backyards fall in, their tennis courts fall in, people fall in, my friends fall in, and I laugh at them. Don't put Plecostomus, pl pl don't put Plecostomus, say that three times fast, into your ponds. And then you also have some um, mussels. I'm working on the research to get those um, added into ponds right now that's in the fledgling stage, but they will actually filter feed just like you do in salt water, and that would be great for water quality. They found that for every foot more you could see in water quality, it was adding 3% to the price of your house in some areas if you had lakefront property. This is not just, I'm not a hippie sitting up here, well I am, but this is not just a very green environmentally project. This has huge fiscal impacts. This affects so many industries in Florida that it would be insane not to do restoration projects. And that's why a lot of offices like the IFAS office or the UF offices really push these projects. And I'm just taking it the logical next step, where instead of just putting in plants, you're also putting in other native species. Please do not go to Petco and get a bunch of algae eaters. Please, don't say, hey, Sean told me you have algae eaters. Can I throw them in my pond? Stop. Ask a licensed biologist what fish would be best for your ponds, or get my card, or there's plenty of lake managers who know what they're doing. Do not put tilapia in your ponds either. They're not native, and they have their own whole host of issues. And they kind of taste good, so if you're going to grow them in a tank, you know, throw them in a tank, but don't throw them in your ponds. They're incredibly invasive. And then, oh, Golden Top Minnow. This is a cool project. So they found out that if you have um, just mosquito fish in a pond, they'll eat 60% of the mosquito larvae. That's good, that's a passing grade. I went to a pass-fail school. I'm like, yeah, that's cool. And they compared it to like another uh, top minnow or another killifish, and those fish were generally 40 to 50% of the mosquitoes. And that's like, oh, that's not very good. But when they combined the same number of fish but half mosquito fish and half minnows, the number of mosquitoes eaten went up to 90%. Same number of fish. And that's because when you have multiple predators, multiple modes of attack, you have good biological control. Hey, we're back to the title of the presentation. And now last but not least, my favorite fish. Uh, he's kind of fun too, but the Florida flagfish. This fish eats filamentous algae. It eats lingbia, which is one of those toxic algaes. It eats duckweed. And it can also chew on a few insect larvae, but it's mostly herbivore. It's used in the pet trade to target filamentous algae in fish tanks. I can get them wholesale. And also, it only lives in Florida. Its scientific name is Jordanelli Floridae. And if you look at it, it's red and white stripes with a blue star. Are you telling me that we could be fighting the red tide with American freedom fish? <laughs> this is amazing. And the best part is the fish is only this big. You could put it in any water body and it could, larva can even survive in drought. Like the larva will survive in small holes. So you don't have to restock. That's amazing. And so then I want to focus on just the two fish that I thought were best. This guy just eats a wide variety. They found out that if you add this guy in with any other fish as forage for bass, the bass get bigger, faster, and they grow larger. That's incredible. That's already a multi-million dollar industry that would love this fish. 70% um, of its diet is vegetation, especially when it's small and it mostly eats algae. And it gets three to 2,000 eggs per life cycle. And it only eats off the bottom, so it doesn't uh, compete with a lot of other fish. Imagine if you had a chemical that had 20,000 new applications every year without you having to do anything. Again, it's fish science, not rocket science. It's native, you, so you, um, with a lot of the, with the grass carp, in order to keep them from leaving your pond, you have to put a big carp barrier, it's kind of expensive, it's a whole hassle. This guy's native. Worst case, you put him in the top pond of an HOA and he stocks all the other ponds. You don't even have to buy more than one set if you can get that top pond really going and you don't mind waiting a while it will stock other ponds. It tolerates a large variety of parameters, like low dissolved oxygen, eats a lot of different foods, and it's got a variable diet, so it'll eat whatever's the most in the pond. If you have a midge fly swarm coming up, it'll switch to midge flies. If you have a bunch of algae blooms starting, it'll switch to algae. It's called abundancy feeding. And another really cool fact about it is low dissolved oxygen. How many of you have seen a fish kill in Florida? They smell. 
And um, it, with the exception of salt water, where it can be all sorts of things, and fresh water, it's usually tilapia that die because they're not native and they can't handle our low DO. You have to have a really bad fish kill to kill native species. So when you stock native species, you don't have to worry about fish kills as much. And anyone who has cleaned up a fish kill will thank you. And then, of course, I want to get a bigger picture of this guy. It's got live birth. It tolerates a wide variety. It can survive in trout ponds. And look at that. It's the American flag. If you love America, you'll save the environment with Florida flagfish. I know stormwater management isn't the most interesting thing in the world, but imagine if whenever you said the Pledge of Allegiance, you just stared at your pond. And now, here, let's get into some of the options. So I showed you five different species. So there were six sport fish that we can stock. So you have more than just largemouth bass. You can get gar, bowfin emia, pickerel, all sorts of different species. 18 different targets for filamentous algae. If you were to look at the number of herbicides we have to target algae, there's like nine total. By doing this project and looking at some of these species, if we can grow them in larger bulk, we more than double the amount of different ways we can target algae. And unlike herbicides, where algae can resist certain herbicides, like copper-resistant algae is fairly common. It just gets a big, thick mucilage. And it's like picking snot out of your pond. This is not a glamorous job, folks. Please make it easier. You can just stock different species, and they'll work together, and they'll keep that from happening. You can also filter out planktonic algae and some of these planktonic blooms. And a lot of the planktonic blooms tend to be more of the toxic ones, with the exception of lingbia. Red tide is considered a harmful algae bloom, and it's planktonic. Uh, trichodesmium is the brown tide. It's toxic. The flesh-eating bacteria, also just bacteria in the water. And that's where filter feeders come in. Um, filter feeders can generally tolerate much higher levels of red tide than most other organisms, because they're used to it. They filter out tons of stuff in the water. They're used to getting these high amounts of chemicals in their body. And to keep in mind, they close shellfish fisheries at five red tide cells per liter. Do you know how many cells we had in Florida in 2017 per liter? In some areas, it was over 10 million. That's the level we're dealing with. And some of those fish, some of those shellfish survived that level. You can't eat them for a long time afterwards, but they survived. And then, of course, we have submersed plants, detritus, which is all that bottom junk, all those different uh, larvae. And when we have things like the Zika scare, when we have West Nile and all these mosquito-borne diseases, imagine if you could stock a water body the size of like one of these tables or a chair with these tiny little fish that'll eat mosquitoes instead of having to put a mosquito dunk in there every month, which I forget. And then I walk out onto my porch where I have my little wetland and I get eaten by mosquitoes. I have three on my finger. Look, it's, it's disgusting. I hate mosquitoes. So we have over 42 different new, if you were to count a fish as a chemical, we're more than tripling the number of ways we can target a lot of these big multi-million dollar nuisances. And so a lot of people are like, well, why don't we just keep using grass carp? They work for a lot of the invasive things. Can we use them on the native plants that grow too much too? And there's some, and I still use grass carp. I still like them. And so the advantages over grass carp are they're cheaper. Grass carp are about $8 a fish. Some of the fish that I'm working with are like three cents. Like, they're not that cheap. You have to stock a few more of them, but they're pretty cheap. It's a, the costs are comparable. They're all native to Florida, so all those people who are like, I love Florida, I want to keep it native, I want to, you know, I'm, I care about the environment. Perfect. Yeah, go for it. Like, they're all native. It's also a lot less paperwork. Believe me, grass cart paperwork is insane. That's why you pay me. The native fish is a lot easier. I don't have to do all that permitting. I hate paperwork. That's the main thing I charge people for. Um, you can do it in any pond size. You can target a wider variety of things because you just pick one species, one or two species per each target. You can also prevent, which is a big thing you can't do with chemicals, you can prevent blooms. Um, you improve sport fish, you don't need barriers, they are self-regulating, they reproduce. The grass carp are sterile, so you, don't, so you have to restock them after a certain time. But the grass carp are good, especially against hydrilla. Grass carp are the only known control that will actually eat um, these specialized armored seed packets and tubers and turnians of hydrilla that resist chemical. I actually asked at the Aquatic Reed Conference, are there any chemicals that completely remove hydrilla from a water body? They said, we are not at liberty to discuss that at this time, which is fancy for no, because if they did, they would be selling that all over the place, but it doesn't. It just, nothing kills the tubers and turions except for this big fish that will suck them out of the dirt and they'll hover, hoover form. They love hydrilla. It's like their favorite plant. And that's why I still like using these guys. Native fish don't eat hydrilla because hydrilla is invasive. And that's one of the things where you need some of these biocontrols. But we also, like two out of every three species that I killed as an aquatic plant manager were native. And we shouldn't be using herbicides for those. We can use native fish. 
And some of the disadvantages to grass carp, they're not as effective as against invasives, they're more well-researched. My research is still fledgling. I've only got a few grants out, a few test ponds, but they're widely used in other industries, so I think it's, there's a good precedent for it. Um, there's fewer natural predators. Believe it or not, even gators have a hard time eating a six-foot fish. Like they, nothing really eats them, but the native fish will reproduce, and they can talk, tackle a larger amount of plant material. Again, they're, they're six feet. They're really cool if you ever see them in a pond. Like Check them out. And then chemicals. Well, why don't we just keep spraying everything? It seems to be working, right? Okay. No, it's not working. So it's cheaper in the long term. Once you stock a pond, it might be slightly more expensive up front, but the long, it's permanent. You don't have to restock these ponds most of the time. After you do the initial few stocking events, you're done. It's environmentally friendly. You don't get cancer. It's safer for technicians. Most people don't care about us guys on the job. And when you're working outside in 110 degree weather in Florida, it sucks. I hate doing my job. I want this project to be done so I can go to a job that makes more money. I'll be a banker or something. So if we can do this and we can like reduce this industry, we can put money and funds towards, honestly, better projects. We should not be wasting billions of dollars on stormwater ponds and invasive species. We have veterans, healthcare, school, education, world peace. There's all sorts of things we can go after. Why are we spending it on plants in our ponds? It improves water quality and it's preventative. You can't prevent algae blooms with chemicals with the exception of aluminum sulfate and that's a long conversation we can talk about after this which is not applicable for every pond so I'll put a little asterisk there. And then disadvantages. It's slower, okay? When you spray some of these plants, some of these chemicals work within hours. And that's what a lot of people like, is instant gratification. MBC, multimodal biological control, can take a year, sometimes two. But once it's done, it's permanent. And you have permanent reductions in a lot of these problems, and treatment costs go way down after a while. It may not work on invasive species without biological controls. It might be more expensive up front, and that's really it. There's a lot of reasons to do this and few reasons not to. And for the few plants that have no biological controls, like Brazilian pepper, I think we should still use chemical for those because there's no alternative. It's not like I'm saying, never again shall we touch an herbicide. It's instead of spraying everything as a first resort, we use chemicals as a last resort. We do everything else in our power before we start spraying all these chemicals that a lot of them are carcinogenic. A lot of them last in the environment for a long time. Some of them have unintended side effects. Anyone who's sprayed Amazapir knows, Amazapir is Polaris, it's an herbicide. It binds to the soil and can prevent other plants from growing and leach into nearby areas. All right, when to use it. And oh, this is another cute Florida native. It's called a spider lily. It always blooms in two and that's beautiful. You don't see this at Home Depot. Go to a plant nursery, native plant nursery. Just roll your face across the keyboard and it'll pop up. Just, there's hundreds of native plant nurseries in the United States and there's dozens in Florida. I have a magazine up there and I have a website where we can link you to some. I'm actually speaking at the Florida Association of Native Nurseries tomorrow on aquatic butterfly gardens. Yeah, you can have a butterfly garden in the pond and it looks beautiful, it looks like that. And so when is the best time to do this? When it's a new pond or wetland. A lot of people hate the way we develop in Florida and I agree, the way we develop in Florida is garbage. But if we can do sustainable development, with native plants, native species, and remove a lot of these issues. I mean, that seems like a win-win. I mean, people need a place to live too, but so do animals. Um, any places that are lacking in native species where algae or native plants are the issue, where you wanna use the water body while you're treating, because some of these chemicals you can't swim or even irrigate your lawn with them for a while after you use them. Um, if you wanna sport fish, if you wanna improve the water quality, so basically everywhere. If you want to attract wildlife, a really cute project I did recently was at an orphan otter sanctuary. There were four orphan otters named Peaky, Busstop, Penelope, and Moose. And if you want to hear more about that, I have that in my newsletter. That's how I get you, baby otters and manatees. If you want to beautify the area, oh, I put improve water quality twice. It's that important, folks. And then use it as part of an integrated pest management plan. Any land manager knows that no one tool in your toolkit is gonna work. It's not like you can fix a car with just a hammer or a socket wrench. You need multiple tools and that's the same thing for land management. Any landscaper, anyone who's been outside for five minutes knows you need more than one tool. And then, oh, here are some cool um, aquatic plants. Coontail doesn't look that interesting, it's an underwater plant, but it's really cool because it's something called allelopathic. That means it kills other plants around it and coontail specifically kills algae and phytoplankton. 
What are the things we're having trouble with in Florida? Say it with me, folks. Yeah, hoorah. See, you all are fish scientists so far. Um, it actually releases a chemical in the water, and then when the algae dies, it soaks it up. It's why the water is so clear with this. Hydrilla actually does the same thing, and that's why some people like hydrilla growing in their lakes, except hydrilla also covers the entire water body, kills everything else, and has drowned several swimmers. Not worth it. We have a native alternative. Fragrant water lily. I would have had some of these here, but I obviously don't want to carry a pond in my truck. It's just a beautiful pond, it's just a beautiful pond plant. Lily pads are vital for several species of birds. They shade out algae. Um, bass actually eat the worms that live in the lily pad roots. It's a weird relationship. There's a ton of different reasons to have lily pads in your pond, and the only reason I've heard of people not wanting lily pads is they're blocking my lake view. If you care so much about your lake view, move out of Florida. You're not living on a lake. You're not even living on a retention pond. You're living in a swamp. Grow swamp plants. And there are some beautiful swamp plants like scarlet hibiscus. That's one of the largest hibiscus flowers in existence. It's the size of my head. And I actually have one of its relatives, the pineland hibiscus over there. It's all closed up at night, but it gets big flowers the size of my fist. That's insane, and it grows in wetlands, and it's part of my uh, butterfly project. If you like, who likes monarch butterflies? Everyone knows the monarch butterfly. Yeah. Oh, not as many as I thought. You all hate the environment. <laughs> I'm just joking. But yeah, there's an aquatic version of milkweed. Most people think of milkweed as a duny plant, but there's actually the aquatic milkweed, which can grow in the water, and obviously the leaves stick out so the caterpillars don't drown, but like, you know, the butterflies will still use it. And there's swamp milkweed, which can grow on water shorelines. There's horsetails, which are one of the most ancient plants in existence. And actually, uh, Native Americans have used it as a toothbrush for a long time because it has silica in its uh, cells, which is really weird. And then duck potato, which is a common uh, wetland plant, gets pretty flowers. And it was named because a scientist pulled it up. It was like, wow, that looks like a duck. I'm not even joking. That's why it was named that. And then the last plant I'll talk about is the pitcher plants. These are really hard to grow, but imagine if your plants started eating those mosquitoes and midge flies too. Florida has the second most carnivorous plants in the world, only behind the Carolinas. Believe it or not, the Southeast US has some really cool native plant life, mostly in carnivorous plants. Like we, I've seen sundews at my sites, I've seen butterworts, uh, bladderworts are really cool. They're an aquatic plant that lives on every continent, and they are the fastest plant in the world because they make these little bladders in the water, and some of these bladders are about that big so they can eat small fish and tadpoles, and when something gets too close, a uh, hair opens and they suck it inside. And they're really good for um, getting rid of mosquitoes, but people don't like the way they look because it's kind of like a matty plant. So you hide it under other plants that look nicer. And future research. I love Back to the Future. So we can look at stocking densities. Um, what are the best species to put in at which time? Like, is it better to use juvenile fish or adult fish? Or when is the best time to put in some of these species? What species work best together? Are there any new species that aren't on this list? I've actually added about eight, nine species of animal since um, I made this PowerPoint a few months ago. Um, Preemptive stocking. So most people want to stock when they already have the issues. The best time to stock is always before the issue. Like, is it better to treat cancer or prevent cancer? Anyone who lives in America and pays healthcare costs knows prevention is always cheaper. Imagine if you just took a vitamin instead of having to go to the hospital. Like, that's kind of what we're trying to deal with here. Instead of doing these massive removals and massive spraying, we just stock. And we have a few grants by the Sarasota Bay and the Charlotte Harbor Estuary Program. We're always doing more research. We're always looking for new projects. And I'm very happy that Ideas for Us invited me over. And yeah, thanks for listening. Any questions? <laughs>